Hello, I'm Laura Marshall. And I'm Melinda Rose, and this is Light Matters for March 21st, 2012. On this week's show, graphene is etched into a supercapacitor, optical material is tailored from DNA, lightning strikes in the same lab more than once, the Japan tsunami is mapped with laser scanners, and we preview the March issues of Photonic Spectra and Biophotonics magazines. Researchers at UCLA used a standard LightScribe DVD optical drive found in many computers and laptops to produce graphene-based supercapacitors that combine the power performance of capacitors with the high energy density of batteries. These strong graphene sheets can be used as high-performance energy storage devices known as electrochemical capacitors. Here's UCLA's Rick Kaner talking about how the process works. We start with an ordinary compact disc. We put a sheet of plastic on it. We coat it with graphite oxide, an inexpensive precursor to carbon-based materials. We can then, on a computer, draw designs. We can put it in a disk drive, and using a laser scribe device, we hit it with an inexpensive infrared laser, and we can make a pattern. We'll see our ordinary compact disk. We'll see our plastic coating and the pattern that we've designed. We'll simply peel off the plastic, and you can see here the nice golden brown material is the graphite oxide, and where it's been hit with the laser, it's turned into graphene. We can take this then and just cut it with the scissors, and we can make different devices. And one of the devices that we've made is a supercapacitor. It's a flexible, all-plastic-based supercapacitor. It's just two pieces put together with a little electrolyte. You can see it's completely flexible. And what's nice about this material, unlike conventional supercapacitors, which can be charged and discharged quickly, but don't store much energy, this stores as much energy as a conventional battery, yet it can be discharged or charged 100 to 1,000 times faster than an ordinary battery. So for example, charging this up for two seconds, we can run a light emitting diode for five minutes or so. The UCLA researchers say the technique could lead to the development of high-power flexible electronics like roll-up computer displays, electronic wallpaper, or even wearable electronic fabrics that harvest and store body movement energy. The research appears in science. Nanostructured materials built from artificial DNA molecules can modify light in very specific ways and could lead to the development of superlenses. Scientists in Germany succeeded in building nanospiral staircases from artificial DNA using a technique called the DNA origami method. DNA origami makes it possible to define in advance and with nanometer precision the three-dimensional shape of the object being created. The DNA strand carries nine gold particles that induce strong interactions with circular polarized visible light. Coupling light and nanostructures may help to significantly reduce the size of optical sensors for medical and environmental applications while also making them more sensitive. Spiral staircases with large particles show a significantly stronger optical response than those with small particles. The scientists discovered also that the particle's chemical composition plays a significant role. When the gold particles were coated with a layer of silver, the optical resonance shifted from the red to the shorter wave blue domain. Next, they will investigate whether they can use the method to influence the refraction index of the materials they manufacture. French researchers coaxed laboratory-generated lightning into striking the same place, not just twice, but over and over. This feat of electrical reorientation used femtosecond laser pulses to create a virtual lightning rod out of a column of ionized gas. This was the first time that these laser-induced atmospheric filaments were able to redirect an electrical discharge away from its intended target and guide it to a normally less attractive electrode. The team sent a laser beam skimming past a spherical electrode to an oppositely charged planar electrode. The laser stripped away the outer electrons from the atoms along its path, creating a plasma filament that channeled an electrical discharge from the planar electrode to the spherical one. To determine if the filament had the ability to redirect an electrical discharge from its normal path, the researchers added a longer pointed electrode to their experiment. Without the laser, the discharge followed the path of least resistance and always struck the tallest object, in this case, the pointed electrode. With the laser, however, the discharge was redirected following the filaments and striking the spherical electrode instead. This occurred even after the initial path of the discharge had begun to form. The work, seen as encouraging for the realization of a laser lightning rod, was published in AIP Advances. Using terrestrial lasers and other methods to map the epic March 2011 tsunami in Japan could influence future evacuation plans and building designs and even help prepare for future disasters. The Tohoku tsunami was Japan's deadliest in more than 100 years and caused more than 90% of the almost 20,000 fatalities that occurred. 
Georgia Tech University's Herman Fritz and his reconnaissance team surveyed the impact of the tsunami on a fishing town in Kessanuma Bay, where 1,500 people died. The area had been hit by historic tsunamis four times before, making it the most vulnerable spot in Japan. Using lasers to scan the port and bay entrance, they created a 3D topographic model of the flood zone. They confirmed that the water goes out first, drawing down to more than negative three meters on the landward side of the trench, which can make vessels hit ground inside harbors. During the subsequent arrival of the main tsunami wave, the water rushing back in changed the water level by 40 feet, engulfing the entire city in 12 minutes. Well, the March issue of Photonic Spectra is now in the mail with its cover story on multispectral imaging in harsh environments. Other features include ultra-fast fiber lasers and materials research, photonic sensors, and lessons learned from a laser accident. And didn't you write a feature for this issue about the PRISM Award winners? Yes, all the PRISM Award winners for this year are in there, and every year it's really interesting to see the products and meet them at Photonics West. Definitely. Uh, the March issue of Biophotonics is also out this week. It features articles on moving non-invasive cancer imaging into the clinic, improved photosensitizers for photodynamic therapy, fighting laryngeal cancer with transoral laser microsurgery, and my own cover story on uh, one multidisciplinary, multi-institution, multinational project that recently found a way to direct nerve fiber growth by using laser-driven spinning microparticles. Wow. <laughs> if you don't receive our magazines and you'd like to, visit photonics.com and subscribe. Well, that's it for this edition of Light Matters, the photonics industry's only weekly newscast. We'd like to hear from you. Tell us what you like or don't like about our program. We welcome your comments and suggestions at lightmatters.photonics.com. You'll find links to share and subscribe to Light Matters by clicking the Share with Friends button on our video player. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. We are building a new sensor that uses light for detection of the different viruses, proteins, and biomolecules, and there are the plasmonics. Uh, sensors and they have been used widely for detection of the dis different proteins and we are just trying to enhance the sensitivity of these sensors. Is that for any specific diseases or conditions? It's basically for basically for detection of the different virus can be used for detecting HIV viruses for example. Mm -hmm.